It's an underrated intro. Indeed. Welcome back. This is episode 41 of the Morning Brushback. I am your co-host, Dan Blewett, joined here remotely. Bobby Stevens from Chicago, currently in Indianapolis. How are you doing, sir? I'm just, I just do this show as a nomad. My car, by phone, by way of Indianapolis. World By travel. way of. By way of. That's what you should get a shirt made that says by way of. We still got to make my arm talent shirts. Yeah. I'm just, I'm really lazy about peripheral stuff. We need a digital assistant from like Sri Lanka to help us. Somebody, somebody with some more design savvy. I have a lot of design savvy actually, but nonetheless. You're really slacking on it then, Dan. You know what? I've, here's the thing. Today's a good episode because I've got carrot juice, which is I think one of the more underrated juices. Uh, I've also got my coffee, man. It's a sunny, sunny Friday here in DC. I'm sure it's swampy as all get out. As soon as I leave my my apartment, a lot of days, I am always recently blown away at like the wall of heat and humidity that greets me, which I shouldn't be. Like I'm aware it's July. I'm aware it's 90 degrees. Like I check the weather before I go out, but then I hit outside. And it's like it hits you in the face. It's, it's, I don't know. I was, it was, it was sticky yesterday, and not couple couple games of of youth baseball in in 90 and 90 percent humidity make you appreciate running water yes so in today's show we've got a bunch of topics we're going to go about an hour because bob has got to get off to a sports match uh we're going to talk about a couple i've got a bunch of so i audiobook a lot um i often especially last last bunch of years like when i was doing what bobby was doing traveling around i'd crush like sometimes three audiobooks in a week i was just driving so much but now i do one or two a week on average when i have a good amount and for whatever reason a bunch that really caught my interest have been released recently so i've been back on another reading binge but uh so we're going to talk about a couple of books and a couple of concepts that i think are really interesting and relevant for parents and players we're also going to talk about some of the players who've opted out briefly um a little bit of COVID stuff and then bob you've got some gripes for youth baseball so why don't we start there what are your gripes right now robert i got gripes with youth baseball rankings in general who's ranking like who's who's developing rankings for nine ten eleven year old kids but i've got real gripes for let me get a little backstory so i sent our our nine-year-old team which is a average to probably slightly below average 90 travel team. But first year kids playing, it's not even real baseball. Technically they can't lead off. There's no, like you're not holding runners on. So it's like, it's like an intro to real baseball when they hit 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So we enter a tournament listed as double a, so double a is less similar to how the big leagues rank their minor league systems. Double a would be lesser than majors, triple a open, whatever you would consider the highest in any given tournament. And we get to this tournament and the team we play first is 17 and 0. Do you look at the record? I mean, they're white, they're whitewashing everybody. And the, but their coach has them listed as double A, which is essentially like a, a below average team, you know, middle of the road team. And they're in this tournament and they are just pounding everybody. And I'm just texting with the head coach, who's one of the dads, and he's he's like, this is ridiculous. Like, this team is just – he's like, they're playing real baseball. We're playing, you know, youth baseball. And it's – at what point are you are you doing it to serve your own ego? Like, great, you're beating the hell out of a bunch of nine-year-olds who obviously can't keep up with your nine-year-olds. But why are, why are you in this tournament when there's also a same, same weekend, same venue – an open tournament, quote unquote, with what's supposed to be the better teams, the elite teams of nine years old. I don't know. This is just bothering. It's just bothering me that your well, team hasn't lost a game all year and you're going to play them against the lesser competition. And most of the time in these lesser competition tournaments, you've got a wide range of teams. Like even, even the middle of the road teams are going to really beat up on the teams that are very, very, uh, I guess, underrated or underserved the well to play devil's advocate how do you know this team was this good when they signed up like months and months and months ago maybe they were kind of like not sure Mm, 
they were sure. Yeah. I'm on the side that they were sure. You could tell okay. too, as a coach, I mean, you've coached a lot of youth baseball. Like you can tell if a team can handle, they might not be the best team at their age group, but they definitely are not like a second tier, you know, everything's got to go right to win the game type team. Like when you can, when you can trot out 10 pitchers at nine years old, you're, you've got a team that's going to win a lot of games. Okay. And they're not even, I mean, it's not even competitive games. You're getting three innings and it's like 17 to nothing. And it's to the point where like the coach has to tell them to not stop running in the second inning because that's not even fun for them. It's not fun. And I don't understand it. And there's a, and it's not just nine years old. It's just the example I'm giving up this weekend because it's happening, but we've been in tournaments and you get at the, the reverse where it's teams that are really low level are entering these elite quote unquote elite tournaments and they're getting pounded and the elite teams are kind of wondering why this team's in this tournament, which it happens a lot as well. But yeah. It does, it does suck when there's a big mismatch. It, no one feels good about it at the end of the day. You know, it's just a gripe when you play your team down and you're I mean, who's, who are you serving at that point? The kids aren't having a good time because it's a lot of walks and it's errors and the game takes two hours to get through two innings. And maybe it's, I don't know. Self-esteem culture, man. I don't, I don't like it. It's self-esteem culture. Well, that gets in, that, that gets into the first topic. I had to look up the, the uh, definition of anti-fragility. Yeah. So, so I don't like, so I don't like this word. It seems like a lame, just like invented word, but this was, the word was coined by, um, I guess a researcher, professor, whatever, back in his 2012 book, which is called Anti-Fragile. And he basically said that in the English language, there doesn't exist a word that represents a system getting stronger when, when given stress. So like a glass jar is fragile. If you drop it, it shatters. A plastic bottle is resilient or durable or tough. You drop it and it doesn't break, right? You bang it on stuff and it continues to not break. Right. But he's like, that doesn't, like you can't call a human who gets, or, or like a great example is your, is your bones. When you lift weights, your bones physically adapt and your muscles adapt and they get bigger and stronger and, and more dense. He said, that's not the same as being durable. It's not the same as being resilient. Like to just, to just leave it there is saying human bones are resilient because when you load your body, your muscle, your bones get denser um, and more you know, difficult to break. He's like, that's not just resilience. Resilience, he said, is like a plastic bottle that you pound it on the ground and it, and it just, it, it maintains its original shape, but it doesn't break. He said, so he said, we don't have a word that says when, like if you had a plastic bottle that you pound on the ground and it actually gets thicker. Like there's not like, that's like durable doesn't, right. Doesn't describe that is what he said. So he's like, so we need a word for it. So he said, it's anti-fragile, which anti-fragile means basically a system can get it can become more fragile so if you don't you know if you lay in bed if you're in a coma we know your you, your muscles atrophy your bones get less dense and brittle and um or if you're out stressing yourself you get more durable and you get more resilient to failure and to other tough situations and your body can physically adapt and your mind can physically get stronger when it exposed to stress and so this obviously has like implications to raising kids and that's how it's often referenced. This was referenced in another book I was reading called the coddling of the American mind, which Bobby, you have to listen to it during <laughs> your drives. It's infuriating. It's really, it's really frustrating what's happening on some of the college campuses in schools and the way some parents are bringing their kids up. Have you heard the term of words or that words are violence? This was a, a big thing recently. I have actually recently now that you bring it up. It was on, what, um, what was the reference radio, you heard in? Some radio talk show. Um, they, it was talking about kids in college that were like that cancel culture, quote unquote, cancel mm -hmm. culture. So, you, you know, whatever you're, you're saying something is at, at another person and your words are inciting violence or your words are violence towards that person when you're really just giving an opinion of whatever. That's what they were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And that's the context that it's used. And, uh, 
And then this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I really recommend, especially if you're a coach or you're a parent or you're an educator. Like I know we have a bunch of teachers that listen and um, one of my friends, uh, athletic director at a, at a school. It's alarming to think that you can just expand definitions of stuff because unfortunately for some people, words are absolutely not violence. Like, I mean, we make a distinction in crime. There's, there's violent crime and there's nonviolent crime, right? right. Nonviolent crime is I stole your checkbook. Violent crime is I punched Bobby in the face and he's on the ground bleeding. And just, just to start to conflate words like, like words are not violence. And I can tell Bobby that he's, that you're, what's like, I don't want to use any, too many curse words here, but you're a spineless, you're a spineless squid, Bobby. Uh, a dog faced pony soldier. Was that the Joe Biden? Quote? <laughs> but, you know, kids on college campus are saying this speaker is, is, his words are violent and I feel unsafe. He's making me feel unsafe. And it's, it's just asinine. I mean, words are not violence and you have a choice of how you respond to words and words can incite violence, but that's a fundamental difference between saying like Dan's words are violent. Like right. words can't be violent. Words can't actually hurt you. Your response and other things can hurt you, but words can. And, and basically this was, this association was poor. It was, falsely made by a professor who wrote some paper a while back and she was basically saying that, you know, because we know that mental health issues exist. So if I say, Bob, you're an idiot and then you get really depressed and then you throw yourself in front of a train, she says, well, then Dan's words were violent. No, like we know that words can cause mental harm, but they're not violent. There's a fundamental difference. Cause I could say the same thing to, another friend and he doesn't throw himself in. he goes ah dan you're just a jerk he doesn't throw himself in front of a train you know what i mean like there's so much more it's not just like oh because this 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 and this that causes that then we could say words cause obesity like words don't cause a cause a, like words are not you know what i mean like words it becomes yeah, this right. runaway thing it's it's insane you can insert almost anything in there it's and it it's very i feel like we're living in a very sensitive time very much so especially on my side i deal with kids a lot so it's not like when i was a kid like when i was a youth kid we were all kind of coached the same it was very hard like you made a mistake you were reprimanded corrected and do it better the next time now it's you almost have to find out well why did you make the mistake why did you why did you do this and I definitely fall into the category of uh, quote unquote old school. Like I'm, I'm hard on kids at practice. I'm, I expect more out of them during games. Um, but I, so an example yesterday, I go out to the, I uh, we're, we're doing well. I go out to the mound and um, you know, the f first thing I do when I get out to the mound is like, a, I'm, I'm looking at the body language of the, of the kid pitching and he's pitching well but he's, you know, he's frustrated. So it's, it's just actively showing like everybody in the stadium can tell he's frustrated stadium, whatever field. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I said, I'm like, I'm like, get on the mound, stand up. I'm like, stick your chest out, have a little bit of confidence here. I go, stop letting every little thing affect your mood. And you know, he made a bad, he made what you thought was a bad call. So what get over it. Like it's time to move past it. It's time to it's ha have a little thick skin when we're, doing whatever. And I kind of echo that in the post game talk. We talk after every game and like, I'm not trying to individually point out flaws in somebody's character or game after the game. Like, Hey, Tony, you did this and this is why you stunk. And this is why you did it wrong. It's no, you guys collectively, if you want to make it and be successful in anything you do, it's time to have a little bit thicker skin, you know, have a little confidence in what you're doing Stop letting everybody else affect your mood and your performance. I think that's, I think that's something that is getting lost in, in general. You're not, people are not taking, everything is affecting you, like very sensitive to everybody else's opinion. Like, can't get inside your own head and talk yourself up. Stop letting everybody else. Yeah. Well, what's happening on some of these canvases is, and this is becoming, they're actually tracking this, the, some researchers, but you know, if, if a, a speaker is coming on campus and is going to talk about a right wing political thing or a left wing or 
anti-feminist or feminist, students who don't share that speaker's beliefs are trying to cancel those speakers. And they'll go there and shout and shout and shout so the speaker can't physically get the word out. And they, it's essentially, they're so afraid of anyone disagreeing with their, like, I mean, the racist stuff that's going on now, the feminist movements, the, all the, the LGBT stuff, basically kids throw everyone into camp. So, you know, if, if we're talking about like transgender rights and I'm for, you know, a side of it and you're for the B side of it, whatever the argument is, if everyone like the commonly held belief is like, you know, Dan's side is the, is, is the just side, then Bobby's not even allowed to speak. Like you couldn't speak on campus. They're going to come and they're going to try to get it canceled. Right. And it's like, we, we need to exist in a society where your views can be challenged and you're still okay. You can still go home and be fine and say, yeah, screw that guy. Like, I don't believe what he believes, but that's first amendment. And that's just academia. And that's unfortunately what's happening on college campuses, which is really alarming. It's really sad. And this whole idea of like professors needing to do trigger warnings for content that they're teaching in class, which is crazy. Uh -huh. And if you don't know what that is, so we're talking about uh, the concept of anti-fragility and uh, some different topics uh, if you're just joining us. But one of these, uh, so in my article that I wrote a couple about a month ago about my experience with, with racism in baseball, I mentioned how two kids that I coached, um, we were talking and I'm pretty sure that I can't, I can't remember the exact context. I'm pretty sure one of them was seeing a, a rap lyric where they said the N word. And I was like, do you know where that word came from? I'm like, do you know why that's such a bad word to say? And they didn't, they said, no, not really. And I told them what lynching was and they'd never heard this about this in school. And that's a, a perfect example of a topic. It's extremely awful. It's a horrible thing that happened in American history. Um, and that's an example of a thing that on college campuses, if they were teaching that, which we need to learn about our past, it helps you understand like the context of the world, right? And when I learned about that sometime in my youth, I was like, oh my God, that's horrible. Like these poor people, it gives you compassion for other people. You know, you can't whitewash your um, history anyway. So that's something that's a, it's a very alarming, very like nauseating thing to learn about because like oh my god these poor innocent people were just mobbed and hung from trees it's awful um but that would require a trigger warning to teach on some colleges because students say that this is causing me emotional distress i shouldn't have to go through emotional distress there should therefore there should be some sort of trigger warning before teaching that that concept and i should have a safe space to go to to get mental support if something like that's gonna be talked about in class, which is unbelievable. You need a safe space. And this is where it comes back to like saying like, talking about that or something else is violence. Like, you know, speaking about that as violence and I need a safe space. You're always safe from words. It's, 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 it's a really alarming, fascinating, scary trend that's happening in academia. Um, well, having a different opinion. It's just crazy, it's crazy. Shouldn't... Having a differing opinion should not should not can't should not force you to lose your job or your livelihood or or even like well yeah and some of the examples in this book yeah are crazy yeah, of, of college else. professors that have been run off campus. Mm -hmm. I mean it's just now it's just more amplified now maybe it's just more amplified now because everybody's got access to everything and everybody's got a voice everywhere. You can post something on Instagram. You could say something on Twitter. You could do it on Facebook. You could. I mean, Facebook can censor what you say, whether whether or not they like it. Uh, Twitter can ban you. Instagram can make you take a post down. So you're basically at the mercy of whoever is running whatever and like whoever's running these college campuses. So you have very liberal colleges. You have very conservative colleges. And if you go to one of those and you don't essentially conform to every single belief, like who believes the same as everybody else? Like who has the same opinion as every other person around them. It's a, it seems absurd. It also seems very boring. Yeah. Well, it there was a, very, like it yeah. just, to, just to like break it down into simple terms. Like if my favorite color is red and I'm in a room with other people who all have the favorite color blue that like essentially in today's world, 
I would be just outcast and shunned. Like, and not allowed to speak possibly? up about it, honestly. Yeah. And you can't speak up because you you're like afraid for your job. Red, you idiot. Like, you're so yeah. dumb for liking the color red. You're wrong. It's not a correct opinion. Your opinion's actually wrong, which makes no sense to me. Like, opinions are never, are not wrong. They no, they are. Bad. They can be I bad. Give a, I, I give a food based personality test that I made up as like an icebreaker to lots of people. And if one of the questions is, what's your favorite breakfast cereal? They're objectively wrong answers to that. Like your, your <laughs> but, favorite breakfast cereal as a kid, if your favorite crazy, breakfast right? cereal as a 12 year old is Cheerios, it's an objectively stupid, bad opinion. It's, but the, it has to be the cinnamon toast crunch or any of like 12 things. It can't be that. That's a bad, but, that, but that's the point though, right? It can be a bad opinion, but it's not necessarily wrong because it's an opinion. It's not wrong. You can have Cheerios with a little, like sprinkle a little sugar on there, throw some honey on there, whatever. Well, opinions can be wrong. So if if you said, "Hey, Bobby, what's an example of a good of a morally good thing?" and you said murdering bears with a pitchfork, <laughs> like that would be a, an objectively wrong opinion. That just like that doesn't fit the category. Disclaimers, like that's your opinion, but it's wrong. But it's something wrong. I don't believe. <laughs> I don't think it's okay to. Uh, first of all, I don't think you could do it. I don't. Th I think the bear would definitely win that pitchfork. You could battle. definitely kill a bear with a pitchfork. I think that's you a good could. weapon because it'd be like coming up at you, and you have it down here, kind of like you're fighting like a you gotta have giant something. squid on a boat, and he like leans down on it. I feel like that's a pretty good weapon. You gotta have some some stones to go after a bear with just a pitchfork. He he putting his own weight onto it. That's how it work. You know what I mean? But he like would you've seen like in movies where someone like like, like spear a horse as like the cavalry's coming and then like the horse's weight like kind of pushes it into the ground and the horse flips over and the guy falls off his horse like in movies. Yeah, kinda but like that, I, horses like that. aren't horses aren't outwardly aggressive towards humans like bears would be. No, but that's not the point. The point is like the weight the the weight and the momentum of the horse it almost like makes like the spear like stands its ground like the bear this is ridiculous this is about this. This like is the so bear's stupid. weight the bear's weight coming down with the pitchfork is what's gonna get it you're probably not gonna be able to stab the bear with the pitchfork what's what's your go-to weapon in a bear fight a bear uh, trap? how about the bear trap that's not a weapon that you can deploy if it's charging you i don't know you could see if you could throw one of those things i feel like a bear trap i mean up. the the thing i think you have to do is I think you have to get let it get kind of close and shoot in the mouth or something with a gun. I don't know. Shoot Bears are pretty big. Mouth. I mean, they have super thick skin and they're scary. I don't know. It, I have the, no experience in this, but so the air. So the answer is is not pitchfork. <laughs> if we're, if, if we're making it the definitive list of bear weapons, I think pitchfork comes comes in the lower ranks. Okay, it's not well, in my top ten. Agree to disagree. What I, anyway? <laughs> um, yeah, but well, and there's another example in this book, which, and it's even people from their same peer group sometimes. So this was a, a speaker who she had been raped and she had another horrible thing happen to her. And she went to a college campus to talk about um, basically that America was not a rape culture. That was her, the thesis of her talk. And students went insane. And she's like, look, a, this has happened to me. So I have experience. So I'm not just some some jerk guy talking about this. Like this is a very personal topic, number one. Number two, I think she was a researcher. Number three, number three, she was she was like, look, comparing to say this about America, it's just patently wrong. She said, if you go to other countries, the instances of rape are extremely high in comparison. It's extremely tolerated. Men get away with it much more. They get um, like, like women get stoned to death for reporting it in other countries. She says it's still a problem in America. Like she says in no way is it like America perfect. She said, but to say that it's a rape culture, it just isn't, she said it, it isn't true. And that's her opinion. Like that's her based on her research and her experiences. And she gave a lot of good data to like, as the author explained her, her side of it, but she was basically just like expelled from campus. And I, maybe she lost her job. I don't even remember, but it's like, this is just another side of that debate, you know, and she wasn't doing anything other than saying, like, look, there's another way to look at this. And we can't just jump to the like the far right of the continuum on any given topic. She said, and again, this is someone who survived it. It's like it's it's crazy. Like they wanted her canceled.
How about and, so? Uh, it's a, so mm, let's alarming. Baseball, right? We've got we had we had Jeff Ryan and Richard Skank on, and it's like same, similar situation, right? Like Jeff Fry lived this lived everything in baseball we could possibly talk about. Jeff Fry lived it. So his opinion, whether you agree with it or not, it cannot be discounted, nor can any big leaguers like who has the experience at the highest level be discounted. That's not necessarily, that's not necessarily to say that you take their opinion as the gold standard, but it's still a valid opinion. Like you can't just disregard the opinion and the flip side of it. And you don't, you can't disregard Richard's opinion just because he didn't do, he wasn't in the big leagues and he didn't have that experience. I mean, I think we see it, you see a lot in sports and it's all over, uh, you know, quote unquote, internet coaching with Twitter and stuff. There's, you can't, you can think somebody's opinion and coaching style is wrong, but if there's proven success with it, or if somebody's shown success with going to that coach or doing what he's, what he's told people to do, you can't, you at least need to listen to it. And it, and you definitely don't just tell him like you're wrong. And it's a, it's, just totally wrong. I don't, you can't have that opinion. You need to change your opinion or stop speaking forever. Like you, you there's gotta be some kind of understanding there that. Well, yeah. And that's, and that's what education should be. Like you can take in all the opinions. Like I took in Richard's opinion and Richard's awful. I took in Jeff's opinion. Um, I don't really agree with Jeff's tactics out on the, on Twitter though. I like Jeff. I mean, you take them all in and you just jumble up and make your own opinion, right? Like all that woman talking about, about rape. There's just, there's just different opinions of it. Just listen to them all and make your own thing. You don't have to feel unsafe because yeah. someone has an opinion that's different than you. And that was the overall point. It's like no one's attacking you. You can listen and reject it or not. But today, kids are growing up, it seems like, with this idea that if their beliefs are challenged that they can actually lash out at people to silence them, which is scary. Um, and it's not like colleges are, are having like clan rallies on campus because they're not right. They're having some controversial people sometimes, which is clear, but it's not like insane stuff, you know, and it's just, uh, it's a becoming a slippery slope, which is scary. And of course, some of the implications of this, the reason we're kind of talking about this is just that, well, a, again, I know a lot of, parents are our audience here and i think it's relevant to know like what your kids are getting into in college potentially but also um just the anti-fragility thing re your sport there's a lot of parents who just want to pave the road for their kids like they get cut from a team they make their own team for them right they just they're constantly on the coach trying to get them more playing time doing this and that like i got i had parents on me for yelling at their kids sometimes like he didn't deserve to be yelled at it's like what's the big deal like, A, yeah. he did deserve it. And B, what, he goes home and he's sad for a night? Big deal. Get over it. Like, you don't think that's going to happen in the real world? Like, come on. And the idea that, that and it just makes them more fragile, because that's the thing with the anti-fragile system is, if it's not stressed, it gets more fragile. If it is stressed, it gets tougher. It gets more resilient. Right. And um, it's not just a, a constant thing. So that's, I think, it just it's, it's a really interesting, it was a really interesting read the coddling of the American mind and this other book, which I'm not quite done. The other one which is called anti-fragile, but um, I mean, and that's why I think you and I have been, everyone who's played a sport for a long time knows this, but there hasn't been a term. That's why like this term doesn't, this term isn't like new to either of us. It's just new in the fact that that's what it's called, I guess, but we know you have to, you have to, yeah, it's learning from failure. It's growth. You know, it's like kind of having the growth mindset, all those things tie into making you tougher when you have hard times go through, right? And if your life is super easy, how are you gonna respond to stuff? And one of the other things that was really interesting is they, they said that uh, kids today are going through major like life milestones later by about two to three years. So that includes like getting your first boyfriend or girlfriend, getting your first job, having sex for the first time. A lot of like the big personal milestones, they said on average we're having like two or three years later. And they said it seems like emotional maturity is also about two years behind compared to past generations. So they said one of the recommendations in the end of this book is maybe give your kid a gap year at a high school because you're essentially sending a 16-year-old off to college 
instead of an 18 year old, like 10 years ago, where kids are, aren't as emotionally mature. And I, and honestly, looking at through that lens was interesting because as I look back at some of the interactions that were less pleasant between me and some players or parents, explaining it in that lens makes some sense where it's like, why did that 15 year old get so upset about getting called out for making a boneheaded play or for just being lazy, like clearly being lazy in pregame. Why do you get so upset? Whoa, it's because he's emotionally mature on a 12 year old level instead of a 13 year old level. Maybe that's why. Right. And I think so that's an important thing to understand too. Well, isn't that part of sports? Like to you're pushing their maturity to the next milestone essentially, or yeah, I mean, you go two ways about it, right? You could either be, be the person that helps them mature more or mature up to their age, or you can, yeah. And baseball you teaches you that for sure. You can able yeah. enable them and treat them and coddle them like, like a, like a infant essentially where they're never going to get up to speed. And yeah. you know, one of my favorite experiences playing baseball was actually going to Europe and playing and not because the baseball was any good by any stretch. Um, but just the culture of, I lived in the Czech Republic, um, like you went out there and coached, not to check, but you went to Europe and coached for what? For, coached five, for a month, a month in Turkey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the difference in maturity of the younger people out there. Significant. Is yeah. Striking. It's very, very striking. I mean, I, we had kids, I helped coach the U14 team um, and in the Czech Republic for that town and they treat it like soccer. So like the, the major, the, the big league team, the major league team had a bunch of age groups all the way down to youth. So I helped coach one of them and just the, the maturity of the kids and the risk, like how they carried themselves and just honestly, just how they, how they got around, like they're like, they got themselves to practice. They like, they didn't have their parents dropping them off and waiting there. They, they either took the bus or they rode their bike or they got the, just the maturity of having some responsibility at a young age yeah. was so much different. Not great. And then not to mention that they spoke two or three languages and, you know, they, they were, you know, they look you in the eye when they talk to you and all that. They just, it's just strikingly different than the U S and, it, and even strikingly different than um, like what I, what I was used to with, growing up at that age where I think we were probably a little bit more mature and pro- and I was sure our parents would say the same thing. They were more mature at uh, X age than we were, but I feel like I, our generation was maybe a little bit more mature that, at 14 than the current generation. They were way more mature out there and further along than even I was at that age. Yeah. So well, they I, say, I and that's another thing they talk, they cover in the book too, which is interesting. They talk about that. And, and where that came from. So apparently there was a big safetyism movement after. So do you, you remember America's Most Wanted, that show? Oh, yeah. With Joe Walsh. Was it Joe Walsh or? Uh, some Walsh. Walsh. Yeah, something Walsh. So his son got abducted and was murdered, which is super sad. And then he went on this big crusade to help that not happen and put kids on milk cartons and all that stuff. He was really integral in preventing uh, future abductions and stuff and getting kids back. And he obviously hosted America's Most Wanted, but they said that that was a tipping point in America where it, it because it brought attention to missing kids so much into the common household, people became more just afraid to let their kids leave and go do things they've been doing for forever. Right. And, um, and they said statistically today, uh, crime is about as low as 1960 or if it's not a crime in general, it was crime against like kids. And you're still like the number one person who's most likely to abduct a child is someone in the family, like an uncle or whoever. Right. Um, And they said, so like statistically, it's no less safe to let your kids go do stuff today than it was in 1960. And it was commonly held as safe in 1960. Kids are, you know, like you said, walking to school, going to the grocery store, grabbing milk to bring home to mom and dad, whatever. Um, But that's not today's culture. And they talk a lot about unsupervised play and how important that is in animals and in humans. Like just being able to go out and play um, is important for brain development and that we have too much work 
and not enough free play, like free play is phased out after elementary school and all that stuff. And he said, those are, so it was a really well-rounded, interesting book. Um, and again, like as a coach, it's, it explains, I think a lot of the way kids are today. Right. And I think as parents, it's, uh, it's probably explained some things that have been going on and it's like, it's just, it's strange. And I just hope the country doesn't continue to trend that way. It's a lot of frightening examples, but, but you're right. I mean, you have to let, you have to trust your kids to do certain things. You can't prevent everything bad from happening. To them. And they gave some examples, like one mom let her kid take the subway home in New York. He like begged his mom till he was like nine and she did. She let him take it home and he got home safe. But then there's a story that you hear that's like a kid was walking two blocks and gets abducted. And you're like, well, what's right? Well, it's hard you know? to live in it's hard to live in fear, right? Like you, yeah. everyone's gonna parent their own way, everyone's gonna do, you know, however you raise your kids, you know, is your own beliefs, your own opinion. And yeah, for sure. Not right or wrong, like what right, it's kind of what we're talking about, right? You can have your own opinion on how to raise your kids or what to do with your kids, but living at, you know, I would personally not want to live in fear, like, cause there's a lot of scary things in the world. The world's not a perfect place. I would prefer not to live in fear. Doesn't mean I'm leaving my door wide open at night in the middle of the night while I'm sleeping. But I, you know, if my, if I live a block away from school, like I'll probably let my kid walk to school and, you know, learn, learn a little bit about his surroundings. I've got, I kind of, my cousin just turned 21, um, a couple months ago. And we always give him a hard time that he can't, he can't get anywhere without his phone, like it, without the maps on his phone. And I, and I laugh cause he goes to, he goes to the Paul, which is in downtown Chicago, like Lincoln park area. And he lives probably, you know, 10 miles West, you know, towards O'Hare airport. So you take the highway or you could take the streets, but he can't get there and he can't definitely can't find his way home without his, without his maps on his phone. And I, and my cousin, I, my other cousin's the same age. We always give him a hard time. And it's like, how do you not know how to get home? You know, how, the the city's gridded. Like it's an easy, it's an easy navigation, but that's, you know, when you're not allowed to and go out when you're younger or, or learn your surroundings and, you know, he's, he's always like either gotten a ride somewhere or, uh, or had somebody yeah. with him that drove him, you know, it's uh, it, what, what, like, Go out, experience the world, drive around the neighborhood for, for an hour and learn the mm -hmm. streets, learn where you, you know, if you only know the street you live on and the place you're and the address of the place you're going, you don't really take in what's around you and can't find your way home. We've talked about this before where, where yeah. I think you brought it up. It's like, Hey, go to this stop sign. You're going to see a big church on your right, make a left mm -hmm. and you're going to get to the, to the roundabout and you're going to go to the third exit on the roundabout and there's going to be a McDonald's. Make sure you go down that road like kind of like finding your own way without having that's how I found my way around the Czech Republic, honestly, because it's, I couldn't read any of the stop signs or any of the street signs. So you kind of yeah. use landmarks. Yeah. But it's, the point is like, let your, throw your kids into the wild. They're, they'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting discussion. Again, highly recommend the books called the coddling of the American mind. There's another book called anti-fragile. So interesting to check out. And also I listened to, no, that was not a Joe Rogan podcast. So I also listened to this book called, uh, I'm almost finished. It. It's called breath It's by James Nestor. And he has a, he's on the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, within the last couple of weeks. So it's pretty recent, but he just talks about, um, breathing and how important it is for health and uh, pretty interesting book. So takeaways, breathe out of your nose. Uh, human mouths are getting smaller because we chew softer processed foods like jaws are physically getting more narrow and our teeth are actually crooked because of the food that we eat, not because really? of other stuff. It's fascinating. Yeah. They said, if you look at skulls of older generations of people, like a hundred, 200 years ago, all of them have like dead straight teeth, like without exception, people that live in like tribal societies, like dead straight teeth without exception. And they don't, have, they don't snore. They don't have sleep apnea because, um, the constant chewing of tougher food keeps their straight teeth. Like te teeth don't come in crooked. They just become crooked. And the, the, the more powerful pounding action of your jaws with tougher foods keeps your actually adds bone to your jaw, keeps your jaw wider, keeps your airways wider and your mouth wider. And it keeps your mouth shut more at night, which is where snoring comes from. <laughs> So really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in that one too. 
but we'll probably get into that a little more at another time. I'll finish that book first, but I'm, I'm almost done it. So pretty interesting though, but I've been, I've been, as I've been working out, um, which this is the fourth week for me, Bobby, I made a whole month. I made a whole month here. Are you seeing gains? Come on. Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, I put on, I put on weight pretty fast, but um, I've been breathing out of my nose in workouts. I was actually doing this for no good reason before reading the book, because I feel like that's your reward for being in like decent shape. Cause I've been running a lot before I started lifting again. And when you run a lot, you don't have to breathe as much. And that's actually a fundamental thing. He's talking about the book, which is that basically less breathing is better in addition to breathing out of your nose. Like the best breathing rate for when you're sitting is five and a half breaths per minute. Which is really slow. It's a, almost 10 seconds of breath. Yeah, I mean, I could, uh, when you're conscious of it, where, right now I feel like I haven't taken a deep breath in 15 minutes, like an actual breath. I'm just kind of sitting here talking to you. But the author did a, stu- he did a, he used himself as a guinea pig, which I appreciate when authors do this in addition to doing research. He got his nose, he got his, his nose plugged up with silicone for two weeks. So he could not breathe through his nose for two weeks, like permanently plugged. He said he was just absolutely miserable. Like his quality of sleep, just like everything in his life was just terrible. And they did this to monkeys in some really That's awful, so awful, awful, terrible. awful studies. They plugged, they plugged monkeys noses for two years. This one researcher did, which wow. Wow. would never happen today. Cause it's just an awful thing to do to these poor animals, but they were their jaws and their fate, the shape of their face changed quickly with their nose plugged, changing from nose breather to mouth breather changes like the shape of your face. It's, it's, it's honestly really interesting. So I can see you, I can see you mouth breathing right there, Bob, close your mouth. You look like a, you look like a carp. (laughs) Okay. So let's go, let's transition into something sports related here. This is all sports related. No, I want to talk. I want to ways talk ways of raising your kids and breathing out of your nose when you're in competition. What do you What do you got on the Phil? What was it? Philadelphia Eagles and Phillies. No fans for the rest of the year, correct? I mean, I feel like that's. I thought that was like already kind of settled, but I guess it wasn't. Not officially, at least. But yeah, no fighting Phil's fans in the stands. What, what, do you, what do you got? On? Would you attend it? Would you attend a sporting event? Yeah, I'd sit way off away from somebody. I, I'm not going to to sporting. I, I, I dress up in like a Kentucky Derby, my my finest. Get a straw hat. Like, like get a monocle. Get a monocle. It's like being BNS, like getting out of prison. It's, we're we're going out on yeah. the town tonight. You know, I the football one is if there's no fans at the at the football game, that's going to be uh, baseball. I feel like a lot of us grow up not playing in front of people even in professional ranks i mean there's you've played in front of empty stadiums and Mm -hmm. yeah all the time baseball football is going to be an interesting one i think like i think it's gonna be very interesting to have no football uh no fans no tailgating at football games because those stadiums are massive like imagine like the big house in michigan somewhere like that Mm -hmm. where they hold one hundred ten thousand. just it's gonna be eerie yeah it'll be creepy i mean all of them are creepy I think it'd be interesting to watch the game too, because it's, you're going to, you're going to hear a lot of the calls. You're going to hear a lot of the, a lot of the things going on, you know, on the field, like it, especially if they've got the boom mic, you're going to hear the, you know, you're going to hear the, ins- instead of Peyton Manning being mic'd up yelling at Omaha, you're just going to be able to hear it. You're going to hear, uh, you're going to hear Nick Foles of the bears just checking down to a slant. Go bears. Go Bears, Dot Bears. Yeah, it'll be weird for sure. Um, I I would be curious to see if like the showboating after tackles and touchdowns, if that decreases in the NFL. That'd be interesting to to think about. Yeah, or the celebrating when you score a touchdown. That's what that's that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I meant. Who are you, mm-hmm. who are you celebrating with or for? Just yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got to go down to some degree. It just has to. Let's just get back and get this game over with. You know. Yeah, it's gonna feel like a practice almost. It's well, like, and I, I mean, just like the energy of a game, like you making like a, you know, the final two minute drill down the field, 
you need you need six points, right? Touchdown wins it. Um, do you have the same energy, the same hype with no one in the in this in the crowd going nuts? Tom Brady at home, you know what I mean? Well, how about how about the su- the Super Bowl with no fans? <laughs> it's it's like all of it's comical just to think about. What, you have to call it something else. It's not very it's, super. Yeah, the mediocre bowl. I mean, even you know, in baseball, like this whole season is so stupid. Like, who's gonna even care about the World Series? So it's like the team the, that the wins. Super Bowl may be the first really tainted one, where it's like this was like a normal season. This is like the normal big deal, but crickets, crickets. I, I still think if it, like if the if the Nationals won this year again, DC is gonna go crazy. I mean, they're gonna love it. If the Cubs won, the Chicago White Sox won, Chicago would go nuts. They would love it. But it's really, I mean, you're going to have, it's going to almost be like, uh, like it's just a, a, an afterthought. The World Series is going to be on and no one's, gonna, how many people are going to watch? We went out last night after the game to to grab food and there were TVs on in the, in the place we were sitting at. And I commented to the other coach, I said, I don't even know if these games are happening now or if they happened 10 years ago because nothing's happening mm-hmm. like it's it's almost like i haven't thought about sports like professional sports in months just like the thought of like oh the bulls are playing tonight or the blackhawks are coming back they've got a game you know rivalry game against the red wings i haven't thought about sports at all i mean life has gone on whatever mm-hmm. it's gonna be yeah, I, I think the best i think you i think you said it i think the best scenario is that the nationals win it again just like it's just like extends it extends their legitimate world series right Right. you get like one and a half everyone's fine like they won it last year okay cool and then we'll just move on but yeah if like some other team wins it who like who cares like it's it's just asterisky and it's just too small of a sample size like we all know that anyone can beat anyone any given day in baseball It, it can happen a team that's like never won a world series like the Padres or uh, if they just get hot and all of a sudden they win the world series and, <laughs> and they're just going to be, they're going to be shamed for having won a world series in a season of 60 games. And nobody yeah. counted no. for them. is the yeah. ring going to be half the size? It should be. It should just be like a, like a bracelet and <laughs> not a, not even a ring. Like a gold bracelet you get from, from the mall. It says World Series on it. Absolutely. Yeah, it can't be. It needs to be all cubic zirconia. Maybe just like a ring pop. Just ring pops. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you got on – we have player opt-outs on our topic sheet. What do you got on player opt-outs? There's some some bigger names have opted out um, in Chicago. Michael Kopech, who's arguably the top prospect, if not – elevated himself into the major league uh into established major leaguer nick mark mm-hmm. nick Markakis with the braves was an interesting one to me because he is very close to like personal milestones uh he's close to three thousand hits i think he's got a certain amount of doubles too that would that would catapult him into nick mark how many hits two thousand no he's got he's he's close to three thousand he's like within what? yes not not this year striking range, but he's like one of those guys where like longevity numbers. Hmm. Let me get that. Let me get that number for you, because him sitting out basically ensures he never gets there. Hmm. Um. I mean, I don't have any gripes with anyone opting out. I think the season is stupid, and I think a lot of the guys have cited that you know they have a bunch of kids at home. And maybe their wife has a, a thing or whatever. Like, I, I don't take any issue with any of it. Just do what you need to do. The season sure. is a joke. This whole summer has been a joke for baseball. If you don't want to participate in the joke, then don't just, like, go home. Like, it's fine. It's totally so Nick, fine. Nick Markakis is currently 36. Um, so he would be 36 for the whole season. And he's at 2,355 hits. So realistically, if he could play till 40, if someone would keep him around till 40, he's got a shot at 3,000. It's about think he, think he can get 150 hits a year for four more years. He had 118 hits last year. 
and he had 285 and 414 at bats. I think he was hurt a little bit. Okay. Because uh, 400 at bats is feels like two thirds of a season. So he's, I'm not saying he's going, he's a guy that's going to get 3,000 hits, but out of active players, he's probably, it's a not guy, out of the realm. Yeah. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Gotta, sure. You know, his 162 game average is 180 hits a year. So for him to get 150 hits isn't, isn't unlike him statistically. Mm-hmm. So for which, someone which like makes that, sense. Yeah. Somebody like that. And he did, he did actually play 162 games in 2018, which is impressive. Good job, Nick. Yeah, um, very good yeah job. he's like a journeyman, slightly above average major leaguer for all yeah, these years. Good. He had probably a couple All Star games here, some Gold Gloves, a Silver Slugger award. Like he's had a, by any account, a very, very good career mm-hmm. with the Orioles and the Braves. But he's a guy. So when he opted out, I wasn't like shocked. It didn't knock me off my feet, but. He's a guy who's accumulated counting stats and baseball is all about your counting stats that this losing this year would d- dramatically affect like pot- his potential, you know, standing in baseball lore mm-hmm. when he retires. So he's 188 home runs. So he could hit that anybody. So for anybody listening, if you hit 200 home runs in the big leagues, you have uh, your name on a plaque in Cooperstown. So anybody that's ever hit 200 home runs is on a is recognized in Cooperstown. So that's something like to be recognized in Cooperstown for anything. One game, a career, is a significant milestone in baseball. Yeah, which 200 home runs is a lot more than people realize. It seems like a small amount because you could be a bopper and do it in four years, but that's 20 home runs over 10 years. It's hard just to play 10 years in the big leagues in general. No doubt. Not to mention hit 20 every single season. So that's uh, it's a bigger milestone than people realize. I mean, hitting 280 in the big leagues is a much bigger milestone than people realize. Like Nick Marquegas is not, he's not like, I don't like, I don't care about Nick Marquegas's career. Like it's a, kind of like forgettable in the sense of that he's not like a star, right? He's, but he's like a very good, a slightly above average player who lasted a long time and is respected. And uh, there's more to be said for that than people say about it, right? So, right. yeah. Yeah, he's but. a career 288 hitter, one all-star game, silver slugger, three-time gold glover, you know, pretty much a staple in the top of the lineup for the Orioles for 10 years. I mean, he's a – if you were an Orioles fan, Nick Markakis was probably the f- face of the franchise for half a decade. Yeah, which is part of the reason I feel pretty humdrum because that's – I mean, he just, like, wasn't as – he's not productive enough to be the face of a franchise. Just wasn't. He's not – yeah, he's not a superstar personality no. per se. He's not a Miguel Cabrera. He's not a Jose Altuve. He's not a any of those kind of caliber players. Right. He's a but good he's... player. He's a really good player and a very respected player. But he was – like, the Orioles just absolutely stunk. <laughs> I mean, and – that's just like not the cow like adam jones was like a legit like franchise type player in his prime like he was good really good like 330 whatever i can't write off adam jones stats but but anyway back to opting out i don't i don't fault anyone for opting out just do what you got to do the season's a joke major league baseball is a joke if you want to take care of your own and that's what you feel like you need to do then just by all means do it no issue with it it's interesting that some of these, some of the guys like Kopech would be a. Um, um, well, he was going to be iffy to even play at all because of his Tommy John surgery, and he well, got some set, he, would, he had some setbacks recently, right? I think he was. I, if there was a normal season, I think August was like the target date for him to come back. So he's yeah. kind of like you know, if you're the White Sox, you're thinking we're going to get a quote unquote full season out of this guy, and without really restrictions because there's only 60 games, so you have to worry about stretching him out or. Or anything like that, um, you know, you're you can make a little bit of a run with with your best arms, which mm-hmm. is something you would you know want to do essentially. But uh, I, uh, you know, as a selfishly as a White Sox fan, I want him to pitch, but you can't you can't fault a guy for not wanting to to pitch or whatever. In- I mean, this is a very common situation that he's in. 
which yeah. you, what is there to gain by the last month of the season? This I happens mean, to a lot of people. It happened to me twice because I had August surgeries both times. And you're like, I could, I could catch on for the last month. They're like, what good is that going to do, Dan? You're, I'm like, you're right. Because you don't, you don't jump in there as quick as you think you will. You don't just like jump in there and start throwing seven shutout innings. Yeah, like you need more time. You have to go through the minor leagues. Like he's not even to the point of throwing to hitters. I don't think. I think he's been struggling recently with his rehab. Like you need to have. You need to, it takes a while to build up to it. Longer than people realize. So he's in. A, yeah, I think that makes perfect sense for him. Like screw this dumb season. Yeah, competitive. Of course, on the other hand, it's such a dumb season that it's also like a like dip your toes in the pool kind of situation too. So there's also that. You know, where it's like, hey, the season's a joke. <laughs> like, come get some fun innings. Doesn't really matter, right? Nothing's really at stake. So there's also that side of it too. But again, I think I think that's a reasonable decision for them, having him opt out. Because you don't want to ruin a chance where he has to get a second one or something for this season. No, I'm with you. All right, last last thing, and this is more of a trivia question for you, Dan. I, just... I also have a viewer question I want you to answer, though. Oh, what's that? I have, a, I have a, a, a viewer question. Okay, let's do that. How do you deal when you're on a college summer team and you paid to be on the team, but now you don't get any playing time at all? A college What, what should your team? All yeah. right, you mm -hmm. travel. College team. Oh. Well, one, I've never been in that situation because we, we never had to pay. I don't know if you ever had to pay to be on a college summer team. We never had to pay to do that. I think there was a small check, but I can't remember. It was maybe like 150 bucks or something, but I don't, it wasn't significant. I played in three summer leagues. I played in the uh, Central Illinois Collegiate League, which is now the Prospect League, the Northwoods League, and the Cape Cod League. And all three of them were free, essentially. But this, the Central Illinois League, I had to pay for my apartment. But the, to play in the league was free. Um, I would say tough like college baseball is is no there is no guaranteed playing time once you get to high school uh, I think the all, all guaranteed playing time goes out the window I understand the you're paying to be on the team and essentially never getting innings but your first course of action almost has to be talking to the coach and asking them what you can do to get on the field like what what do you need from me to get so I can get more opportunities out there. And I think that goes to any level of baseball. It's an appropriate question to the coach. But when you're in college and you're not getting the innings you feel like you should get, you've got to you've got to ask the coach. I mean, there is no parent involvement at that point. And quitting or trying to go find somewhere else you're going to play is that is that relieving the situation? You're still the same player, right? You're still the player who's not going to play on certain teams for whatever the reason may be. So you got to find out that reason and kind of attack it. I'm sure there's more to this. I'm sure there's more of a reason why he's not playing or he feels like he's not playing, but you, uh, I think gut, you know, gut initial reaction for him is probably go find a new team, but that's not going to solve your issue. Your over your overarching issues of why you're not in the lineup. So but based on position, based on who's on your team, I mean, you really need to find out how you can get in the lineup and get more opportunities. Also, I have some back, I have some back questions about it. Like, has he played and struggled? Has, you know, has he gotten any opportunities to be in the lineup and just not taking advantage of them? I mean, I know it's hard to take advantage of, you know, getting hits or throwing innings when you're only throwing once a week or getting to play once a week. But there's more. There's definitely more to that. And the answer is never just pick up and leave. And like, there's, you've got to, what time can I talk about? What we talked about before, like anti-fragility, right? Like you, a little bit of adversity, you got to try and overcome it. You can't just try and, you know, find a situation that appeals more to you. Yeah. Maybe it's not yeah. Agree. Agree. All right. What's your trivia question? My trivia question is, What's the record for most games a player's recorded a hit in a single season? So 162 game season. What's the record for them for the games you've somebody's recorded one hit? So it's so like a, 
uh, who got all those hits 56 games in a row. Uh, am I drawing a Joe, blank? Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio. So Joe DiMaggio had 56 game hitting streak. So obviously nobody's ever had 162 games with at least a single. So who do you think? 143. Uh, you're it's you're a little high. <laughs> you're wrong. You're a little high. 134. 135 is the record. So five guys achieved 135 hits. Uh, who or they got hits? They got hits in 135 different games. 135 games out of 100. Um, 100 one guy did it out of 154 games. Actually, two guys, and then three guys did it in 162 games. Can you name any of these guys? No, absolutely not. I think you could. Willie Mays. It's not Willie Mays. <laughs> Kirby Puckett. Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn was what the guy that proposed the question said. Tony Gwynn and Ted Williams. Did Tony Gwynn or Ted Williams get a hit in 140, 145 games in a single season? And the guy that responded, Ryan Spader, the ace of Spader on Twitter, said, no, the record's 135. The most recent guy was in 2001. Somebody you would think, like, this is – He's the most obvious of the five. Speed, lefty, 2001, MVP. Speed, lefty, MVP, 2001. I don't. I don't know. I got nothing. Ichiro. Oh yeah, that's a that's an obvious. You're right. All right. Ichiro in 2001. Derek Jeter in 1999. Wade Boggs in 1985, Chuck Klein in 1930, and Rogers Hornsby in 1922, which might be the most impressive one because he did it in eight fewer games. Hmm. So he would have owned the record. Dang. Should have got one more there, Rogers. Mr. Plural right. name. Just but, an And then yeah, trivia. That is an interesting fact because that's what? Uh, 162 minus 135. That's 27 less games, so that's a hit in 85% of the games. Which is insane. That's it's extreme consistency. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know what Derek Jeter's 1999 season looked like, but I'm sure it was very good if you're getting that many hits. Wade Boggs was always a good hitter. Roger Schwarzman was always a good hitter. Ichiro, uh, it also he was, has the he was stat. Decent. Up, he was decent. It also has a stat up here. Like Ichiro had – like flirted with 135 games six other times. So just the model of consistency with that guy. Sounds right. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for being here. This is episode 41. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, share the show, retweet it. We'd appreciate you. And um, Bobby, send us off, man. Have a good weekend playing baseball. A lot of youth baseball. We'll see everybody on Tuesday. This is the morning brushback. See ya.